Let us commend this moment to the Lord in prayer. Then let us begin. Our gracious God and eternal Heavenly Father, we are grateful to you for your love and care that you have lavished upon us this past week. Uh, since we last met like this seven days ago, thank you for keeping us safe and taking care of us. Each one, you have provided for us all that we needed, kept us safe and in good health generally. And Lord, you have supplied our needs, though we do not deserve them from you, Lord, but you have been gracious and kind. And for this, we just want to thank you. We thank you for disciplining us, even to know that every Lord's Day we must come together and assemble in your holy name to honor you and to worship you in a special way than we would worship you every other day of the week. Thank you for this feat that you have brought into this house. And as we come to the Bible study moment, we pray that you would unction us with your spirit, helping us to see the gems that are hidden in the truths of your word. And that so seeing we will be well knowledged and have to apply to our lives by us. Because word that sanctifies us. And so we pray your help to us. Those who are still on the way coming, would you quicken them that they would together join us so that we may worship you aright together, even for the glory of your holy name and for our own edification as saints. These things we pray in the loving name of your Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Uh, good morning. Happy to be here with you so that we can together again continue uh, plowing on in this series of the commandments of God. Today we are tackling the fifth commandment, which is found in Exodus chapter 20, verse 12, or even Deuteronomy 5, 16. Let us start the word of God and read the fifth commandment. Exodus chapter 20, verse 12. Someone read it for me, please. Exodus 20, 12. Picon Bonnie, can you read that one? Please do. Okay. Honor your father and your mother so that you may live long in the land the Lord your God is giving you. That's another version. Your days may be long, isn't it? A version. Someone turn to Deuteronomy and chapter 5. Yes. Okay. I wanted us to read that because the rendering is... Do you, you noticed? In one, it says, uh, so that you may live long in the land the Lord your God is giving you, and it ends there. But in Deuteronomy, Moses uh, writes it as does. Eh? He says, honor your father and your mother as the Lord your God has commanded you, so that you may live long and that it may go well with you in the land the Lord your God is giving you. In other words, in Deuteronomy, it is not just that you, it's not that the issue of longevity, that you may live long, right? But that it may also be well with you as you live long. A blessing of not just having a long life, but a good long life, right? Not just a long life, but a good long life. You remember that when we were doing the other commandments, we say that in outlook, they have got a vertical, a vertical outlook. There are those commandments that have something to do with how we relate to God, isn't it? All right? 
we relate to God. The first one saying, we shall not have any other God before the Lord our God. Isn't it? That's what it's saying. Okay? Remember that I'm the Lord your God who got you out of the land of Egypt. I'm the Lord your God who brought you out of, the, of Egypt, out of the land of slavery, slavery. You shall have no other gods before me. You shall have no other gods before me. So it is something to do with how we relate to God, how we look at him. And if you continue to remember, continue to remember the introduction that Pastor Tony gave to us, it showed that there is a way in which God is relating to us. He calls himself our God. He wants us to be in fellowship with him, even as we look. To remember that he loves us and he wants to show that love to us. And we saw that the only way that we can be able to obey the commandments or the outlook or attitude we are to have in the commandments is an attitude of love towards God. If we love God, then we will obey those commandments. Jesus Christ himself says that later on, isn't it? He says that if you love me, obey my commands. So we have left those four vertical ones and the transition one, which was number four, and today we want to deal with the first one that deals with the interrelationship between human beings. These ones are now what you probably call the horizontal ones, isn't it? The horizontal um, commands, for want of a better word. For want of a better word, the horizontal commands, because they did with human to human relations. Okay? This one's deal with human to human relations. The vertical, the, the horizontal uh, commands. And the first one that God would deal with is this one about honoring parents. It is the first one he deals with. Theologians believe that although all the commandments have the same force of law before God, the fact that he sets them in a certain pattern means that there is a priority of importance. That is what theologians have come to believe. That there must be some priority. And so the first ones have to do with how we relate to God. The fact that God does not to have any other God before him. Idolatry he forbids. Then he says don't, don't make idols. Don't, don't, don't have them and worship them. And then he comes down and comes the fourth one and we talk about the Sabbath day. So the first ones you see have something to do with God himself. Even the third one. Not using his name in vain, isn't it? Then the fourth one he says how we worship him on the Sabbath. When it comes to the horizontal one, the first one he deals with is how children are supposed to relate to their parents. That is how important it is. It is placed on top of that stack of the last six. And it has to do, it has to bear so much with how God wants to order society. order in society and somehow order in society starts with the children obeying their parents you see the importance that is where order in society begins it begins with children obeying their parents or children honoring to use the correct word honor Honor by children. That is where it begins. Order in society, any society, because our God is a God of order, isn't it? Isn't he a God of order? And he knows, he knows that the where, where society, the order in society begins is where children honor their parents. That's the foundation. 
He does not start wives being submissive to their husbands. You see that? He does not start with husbands loving their wives. He does not even start with parents love your children and don't exasperate them. He starts with children honor your parents. And that is key. And as we go along, you will see why this is key. It's amazing, isn't it? But let us first look at the basis of this commandment. What are the underlying basis, the underlying factors that, that would make God give such a commandment? The first one, if you're writing notes, is that we all are part of a family. We all are part of, everyone is part of a family. We all have parents, isn't it? We all have parents. Whether those parents are alive or dead, there are no exceptions. There is no human being who has been without parents. They must have had to be parents. Not even the incarnate Son of God, the Lord Jesus Christ, could escape that one. He had to be born of Mary. He had to have a parent. He had to have a parent. The child-parent relationship is the only relationship that is true to all human beings. The child-parent relationship. It is the only relationship that is true for every human being who ever walked this earth. However brief or bad, you must have had a parent. Even those who are born still, dead, had parents. Whether it is for good or for ill, we all have parents. A marriage can exist without children, isn't it? You can have a marriage but you don't have children. You can also have children before you are married or without marriage, right? But you can never exist at all without a father or a mother. So all of us, without exception, belong to some sort of family set up where there is a father and there is a mother. And when I talk about family, I'm just talking about father, mother. Father, mother set up. Okay? So all of us, everyone is part of that. Secondly, when you critically think about it, parenthood and obedience to parents has got generational implications. I will explain. In the olden days when people lived longer, you could find a situation where I have my children, right? So they call me father, right? And then my father is so still alive, so there's that generation where they have a grandparent, right? And then possibly my own father's father, my own grandparent, is also still alive. So that generationally speaking, there was a point in time when you could have a son, a father, or mother, here son or daughter, and then you could have a grandparents, both, and then you could have what you call great grandparents, right? And even great, great grandparents. There was, there was a time when that was possible. There was a time when that was possible. I remember when, when we were young, we had our grandparents 
but we never saw our great grandparents. At least I never saw mine. Is any one of you who saw their great grandparent? You did. On which end? Mom, mom or dad's side? On your dad's side. The mother to your to your grandfather or the mother to your grandfather. That's awesome. That's awesome. He saw the mother to his grandfather. Yeah? That's really awesome. Yeah, the mother to your grandfather. That's a great grandmother. Yeah, that's a great grandmother. I, I never saw the mother to my grandfather. I never saw her mother. You did. A sister. Yes, so maybe a younger one. Yeah, maybe a younger one in the household. Yes, yeah. Yeah, so that, that could have been possible. But you can see that there is a generational implication to, to this idea of family, so that in certain instances, a whole lineage, a whole set of generations of the same family could be able to see one another. Could be able to see one another. In the Old Testament, in the Hebrew Testament, you had no, you had no grandparents. They didn't have words for this. All right? They didn't have words for that. For the Old Hebrew terminology, the word that was there was parent or father. All right? And so, you, you don't, if, when you read the Old Testament, you can never find the word grandparent. You won't find it. It's not there. People could live four, five generations, but they would be referred to as fathers. Right? That is, let me give you an example. Go to Second Chronicles. Just go to Second Chronicles and chapter 29. I think if we look at it from there, then we'll be able to appreciate what I'm talking about. Second Chronicles, chapter 29, and verse 2. If you get it, you just read it. Eh? Chapter 29 of Second Chronicles. Yes. Yes. Now, okay, start with verse 1 and 2 for context. Yeah, read verse 1 and 2. Mm -hmm. Now, we know that Hezekiah was the son of Ahaz, isn't it? Hezekiah, son of Ahaz. That was the name of his father. Ahaz was the father to Hezekiah. Okay? So his father had been a king and he took over from his father. If you look at 28, verse 26, the other events of his reign and all his ways from beginning to end are written in the book of the kings of Judah and Israel. Ahaz rested with his father, fathers and was buried in the city of Jerusalem. But he was not placed in the tombs of the kings of Israel. And Hezekiah, his son, succeeded him as king. So the son, Hezekiah was the son of Ahaz. But when you go to verse 20, chapter 29, verse 1 and 2, we are told that Hezekiah was 25 years when he became king. He reigned in Jerusalem for 29 years. His mother's name is given there as a and in verse 2, 
he did what was right in the eyes of the Lord, just as his father David had done. So, why is it now that he's being called the David? But David was his father. Critically, when you read the Bible, you find that David, act, Ezekiah actually comes 14 generations after David. 14 generations. Basically, what it means then is that he, the fatherhood is being spoken is eternal fatherhood. You understand? A lineage. He was in that line. Which means that the issue of honoring parents has a generational implication. It has something to do with your lineage also. It impacts generationally. So in, in that regard, father and mother is therefore more than just a reference to the man or woman who gives birth to us. Although that would be the primary reference. But God is in this commandment concerned about the lasting relationship generationally with parents parents and children relating in a certain way as generations come and go. But thirdly, this commandment is important because if we are to consider that God is a God of order, then the first place where a child meets with some form of authority is in the home. It is in the home. When we look at Ephesians and chapter 5, verse 22, Ephesians and chapter 5, verse 22, we see what I'm talking about. And if someone read, finds it, can read it. And someone can also look for First Peter 3, 1 through 7. Ephesians, Mama Junior, if you can just look for Ephesians uh, 5, 22 through 28, it's a bit long. Then Sister Caro, you can open for us 1 Peter 3, 1 through 7. And then Liz, no, no, uh, John Roy, you are in front. You will look for Ephesians 6, 1 to 3. And then Ezra, you will look for Deuteronomy 6, 4 to 9. Joseph, you will look for 2 Timothy 3, 14 and 15. In, in that order. We, we have to go in that order to make, it, uh, to make it understandable. So yours is Ephesians 5. 22-28. Yeah. Okay, so we can see the ordering. We can see the ordering there. We start with husbands, isn't it? To love their wives, isn't it? And then 
wives are submitting to their husbands, but we are told that husbands are the head of their wives just like Christ is the head of the, the church, isn't it? So it appears that Christ comes right on top, followed by the husband, and then followed by the wife, and then the children. This one is to love the wife, this one is to submit to the husband. But both of them are placed on top of the children, isn't it? So let's, let's now, let's just plow on, we will catch it. First Peter 3, 1, 1 to 7. It's a bit long also. When they see you are respectful, uh -huh. No, just go. Submitting to their own husbands. You are in verse? verse? Verse 7. Yeah, that's where you want it. So we can see Peter adding two, two things about it, isn't it? Two, two ways in which that whole night. He says, Ephesians, Paul just talked about submission. Eh? But now Peter adds that you should be subject to. All right? And then he says, respect. He now uses those words. So the wife is supposed to submit, be subject to, and to respect their husband. Right? But now, the, the, the husband, him, his duty still remains love. Both of them still are subject to Christ. Because you are, we, we are still being told just as Christ is the head of the, of the church. Now, so parents are jointly going to become on top of the children. Ephesians 6, 1 to 3. Mm -hmm. So children are being told to obey honor, and respect. Isn't it? Their parents. Right? That is, now, it, a child is not, just not being told to respect their father. They are being told to respect both the father and the mother. Equally, equally, they must respect both the father and the mother, jointly. The parents become the head of the children. Christ is the head of the church, is the head of the husband. Just as the husband becomes the head, is the head of the church, just as the husband is the head of the, hus the, the wife. But both of them have been put to head the children. And I want us to catch that properly. Deuteronomy. Six four to nine. Who was doing that? That was Ezra. Yes, Deuteronomy six four to nine. Shall write them 
of the law post of the house and of the gates. Yes. Now, look at what he, what, what, what Israel is supposed to do with the commands of God, right? They are supposed to do what? Verse 7. Impress them on your children. There is an element of parents being required to teach children commands of God. Why? So that there can be order. You understand? The only way to achieve this commandment, the only way, the only biblical way to achieve compliance with this commandment in the Old Testament life of, the, of Israel is that the parents were supposed to teach the commands of God to their children. And look how they were required to do it. It looks like I'm digressing, but I'm not digressing. I'm only introducing the commandment. They have been told that these commandments that I give you today are to be upon your heart. He says, press them on your children. Look how it's supposed to be done, the impression. Talk about them when you sit at home and when you walk along the road. Right? Who can explain to me that what that means? Who can paraphrase that? Remember, you are telling your children about the commands of God, right? And the Bible says how to do it is talk about them when you sit at home and when you walk along the road. In fact, it says at when you lie down and when you get up. Yes, you can paraphrase. All the time. All the time. All the time. The only way your children will know the command of God so that there can be order and so that they can honor you is if you tell them the commands of God all the time. What else do you do for your children all the time? Those who have children. What do you do for them? All, yes? You pray for them. Uh -huh. But you can't pray for them all the time. You pray maybe in the morning, in the evening. And but, isn't it? You, but what, do, what is it? There's something that you, I know you know. Something that you, when you have children in the house, you just do for them all the time. Yes. Feeding them with food. Around 10 o'clock, yeah? isn't it? Lunch time, lunch is ready. It's Akumi. Are you happy? You give them something to, to eat. And you give them with a smile and with joy. See, that's where they do a boo 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 something like that, so that they are also excited. When they don't want to eat, you tell them, eat, baby, eat, isn't it? Just eat, because you know it is good for them. At night, before they go to bed, you give them something to, to eat. You feed them all the time. You feed them all the time. God says, for honor to work, in the family setup, for there to be order, you tell hands of the Lord all the time. Anytime you have opportunity with them, when you are sitting down, tell them about it. When you wake up in the morning, tell them about it. Most of the day, if you are walking with them along the road, tell them about it. All the time. Second Timothy. Who was reading for me Second Timothy? Yes, Joseph. Second Timothy 3, 14 and 15. Good. Who, 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 who is writing the, the letter to Timothy? Paul. Paul is writing the letter to Timothy. 
And he says something about Timothy and how Timothy is to behave in 2 sec, in sec, in, uh, Timothy chapter 3, which he has read. Now let us go into it and dive there and see. Chapter 3. Everyone look at your Bible. Chapter 3, verse 14. 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 14, which he has read. But as for you, he is now talking to Timothy. When he says, but as for you, it means he has been talking about something else, isn't it? And therefore the conjunction, but as for you, what has he been talking about before? Let us just look at what he has been talking about before. Maybe in verse 12. In fact, everyone who wants to live a godly life in Christ Jesus, will be persecuted. He's telling him a fact. Verse 13, while evil men and imposters will go from bad to worse, deceiving and being deceived. So there are those who are seeking to obey God who will have to be persecuted. But there are also evil men who will go from bad to worse, deceiving and being deceived. That is what is going to be happening in the world in the latter days, he's telling to but he says, but for you, you, Timothy, continue in what you have learned and become convinced of. Because you know those from whom you learned it. Who taught Timothy? His grandmother, Lois, isn't it? Taught him the ways of God. This is his grandmother. That's why I was talking about the generational influence of these things. You know, right now, Pastor Tony is our pastor. He has his son, uh, Levin, and he has his son, Junior. He may teach them the word of God as we know he does. For him now, it looks like it is for the benefit of only these two children. Especially Junior who has now learned to learn. He has, he has reached a stage where he can learn, he can be taught catechism, and he can learn. But unknown to pastor, what he is teaching Junior will outflow with blessings to the children that Junior may providentially bring forth into the world. You understand what I'm saying? It, it, for him now, he is teaching little Junior to know the ways of God. Olivia is teaching little Junior to know the ways of God. Then Junior, in time, providentially, the Lord gives him his own father. If she is still around, she may still teach the children of Junior the word of God. Seeing it is for the benefit of her grandchildren. And then she may pass on, like all human beings pass on. Then the things that she has taught Junior and the things that she has taught her grandchild, who has come from Junior, would probably now be a blessing to many children coming up. There is a way in which there is a generational implication in this matter of children honoring parents. But it starts here, teaching them the commands of God. That's where it comes from. You see, if we don't get this introduction right, we will not know how it is achieved. That is my point. And I saw that that is the point of many people who have commented. You and I know that there's one of the problems we have in this country is children burning schools, isn't it? It's, it's sometimes even you, I'm sure you, like me, sometimes you are baffled. You, you say, okay, you can't wrap your head around it. How do children just think that burning a school is going to be a good idea? Have you ever wondered that? Because as we never even... It didn't even cross our minds that you can ban a school. Ban a school. How do you ban a school? 
Where do you even get to greet to burn a school? It, it never occurred to us. Anything else we could have done, run away from school, right? But to burn it down, burning it, it, even, it, it never crossed our minds. Nobody ever talked about it. Uh, something has gone wrong, isn't it? Now, as we start grappling and people are saying, oh, it is the just who are not doing this. Oh, it is the government has said we shouldn't kill children. Oh, it is the parents who are doing this. Or, you know, I am not a prophet as such. But from my little reading of this commandment, I realized that where we have gone wrong is here. We have refused to teach our children the commands of God. If we were to teach our children the commands of God, like Israel was told to do, every day, like we feed them, with the same fervor with which we love them and want the best for them, if we were to point them to Christ, children would, they would never burn schools. Because there would be fear of the order in society that God wants. Like I said, it is in the home that the children meet authority, some sense of authority. We are born into a world of authority. And our first interaction with authority must be our parents as children. If that relationship goes wrong, then the relationship we will eventually have with society will go wrong. There is no way that if you have children who disobey you, they will one day obey society. They won't. That is why we have a society today that is violent, a society that is disobedient, because disobedience in the home leads to despising of authority in all its forms. Obedience in the home leads to obedience of the order of society. Respect for old age. Respect for civil authority. Respect for Christian leadership in the church. If, 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 you, if you have a child who does not obey you, how will they obey the pastor? And the elders in the church. How? How will they obey the government and the laws that the government keeps? Yet they did not obey you. The encounter of a child with some form of authority in the home or lack of authority in the home leaves an indelible mark. Leaves an indelible mark. You cannot, you cannot change the outlook later on in life. And God wants us to teach the need for authority and submission to authority. And he does this in the home through parents. He has made it clear that the whole society, family, state, school, church, he has ordained in all this some sort of authority. And that is part of God's plan. That there must be authority and order. And the first place, you see, by nature, women are sinful by nature. Yet God in his plan knows that even between those two, a husband and a wife, there must be the person to be led and the person to lead. Right? Yes. There must be the person to obey and the person to give the orders to be obeyed. Even in the set of, a, uh, of parents and a child, there must be those to be led and those who are leading. There must be the person obeying the orders and the person giving the orders. Now, that is God's plan. In his words, 
He knows that the only way society can be ordered. That is the only way society can be ordered. I read somewhere that teaching in schools is for today than it used to be before. Because the world has neglected these lines of authority. Children are no longer aware of these lines of authority. Why husbands in the home are themselves not observing these lines of authority? And someone has said children learn better what they see than what they Lillian in Ukweli. Did you post something like that on your Facebook? Yes. They learn better what they see than what they just hear. They learn better when they see it. Right. They learn better. Now, the problem is that now in the homes that we have nowadays, the issue of equality and feminism and equality, these have been so stressed. Oh, girl child rights. Oh, boy child rights. Oh, you know, we are looking at the wrong things. In the Bible, do you see anything about girl child and boy child? Are, are they there? You know, we are focusing on things that even the person who created us did not focus on. So we, we sort of have gone astray. So that we have confused children instead of pointing them to how to honor their parents. We have confused children with diversionary tactics. We, we, we focus their minds on certain other things. We keep on drumming on the girl child, the, the, the daughter in our house maybe, if we had one, a, a small one, that you know you are equal to your brother. You are not different. You and your brother are equal. All right? So when you you should also wash dishes. So, 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 so this, this girl grows up thinking, what is this thing about me being equal to my brother? It's about how she has been. And the brother told you know you are equal to your sister. So you know you must also do so. You are focusing them. What we should be doing telling them the commands of God. Teaching them that there is a God in heaven who has created all of us. This God sent his son, the Lord Jesus Christ, to die for you and me. I am a sinner. You are a sinner, my child. If we don't look up to God, we will perish. Even as you go to school to learn the things of school, remember that there is a God in heaven who loved us so much that he sent his son to die for us. That you are like to be saved. This past week, Pastor Conrad Bewe has been doing an evangelistic uh, uh, at Kabwata Baptist Church. I listen, he was about family devotions. And he says, if you are doing family devotions, one of the things that it should be, it should be evangelistic. Why? Because children are sinful like us. Help your children to know Christ, to come to faith. Do not assume that because you are a believer and your husband is a believer, then that these children are okay. No, continue drumming it into their heads that there is a God in heaven who loves us, who has sent his son to die for us, that we may not perish in sin. And teach this to your children. The commands of God. Teach them to love that God with all their heart, with all their minds, with all their souls, and with all their strength. And to love their neighbors as they love themselves. That is what we should be teaching children. But that we not do that. Instead, the husband and the wife busy trying to their children 
that in this house we are equal. Is he telling their ch the, the children, you know this daddy of yours, there is nothing different between me and him. We are equal. I am working, he is working. Right? I am doing for you these things and he is doing them. Sometimes you even tell them that I am the one doing them, he doesn't even do for you. And you hope that these are children who will obey, obey their father, isn't it? And that will obey authority. Or you are busy telling them that you know I am the one who is doing these things for you, your mother is not doing them for and you are hoping somehow by some, that those children will obey their mother and respect her. You hope through what you are teaching, but through some miracle, come another place. Maybe when they come to church, I don't know. They will be taught that you know they should respect their mother, that they should honor her. That, that they should sub, be subject to her. But you don't teach it at home. You don't teach it at home. This is not helpful. This is not helpful. It is not helpful. What is helpful is this one teaching children the commands of God then they will learn to respond to authority right now children behave in ways that a few years back would not have been tolerated would not have been tolerated when I was going to primary school I used to be kind every day for one reason or another sometimes just for speaking or sometimes not for speaking at all I would be kind I would be kind for not bringing firewood for the teachers to cook their food with bringing a way of putting in the school garden or for getting late after break or for, you know, wearing getter in my trousers. They will remove it and then cane. We were cane for one reason or another. We never thought of burning a school. No, no, no. Now, I am not saying that children should be cane like us we used to be cane. That was our life. But you and me who may have gone through that, maybe not many of you went through it because not many of you as are, are, as are old as I am. Even if you went through just a bit of it, do you regret it? Do you really regret it? Isn't that what has made you the person you have come out to be? It is what has made me who I am today. The discipline that was given to me by my mother, I will never forget. Though she is dead and gone, it lives with me. It has made me to respect authority and to respect other people. It has made me to know when to go down. Even though I believe that right, I will go down for the sake of order and quiet and peace. Because my mother taught me. Time when you have to go down. Even though you believe you are right. Then amongst your peers, there's a time to give them and to let them carry the day. Respect to order and authority. Right? But if you teach children about their rights with fists up in the air like Migona Migona's fist, my right, I am the, you are the head, not the tail, you tell your children. Right? And you have rights. You have a right. You don't have to obey no one. You have a right. Rights of children. Children rights. The apostle Paul had rights, but did he insist on them? As a pastor? If our own pastor was to insist on his right, would he even pastor us? He wouldn't. If me as an elder in this church, I was to insist on my rights as an elder, would I even be in the eldership? I would not. I would not. 
we are having these problems because we have refused to teach the children the commands of God. That is the conclusion I've come to. You can come to yours through your own reading of the scriptures. But me, this is what I've as this, the reason. Lastly, on those basis as we had one, two, and three, the fourth one is that children are the men. And that is where I will stop them next week. I will come now to honoring parents proper. All right? So this command also I'm dividing it into two. So today we are doing the introduction to the command. Eh? The basis of the command. Now the last basis that I give to you is that children or the child becomes the man. The child becomes the man. The child becomes the man. Or if you don't like the word becomes, you just write the child is the man and the woman. So if you are writing notes and you want me to remind you, the first, the best, first basis is because everyone is part of a family, right? Secondly, because obedience to parents is generational. It has got generational implications, right? And we took that. That was very clear. And three, because the home is the first encounter of author with authority for the child. It is the child's first encounter with some form of authority. And lastly, because the child is the man or the woman. And then we close. What do I mean? If a child starts right, look at Proverbs 22.6. Proverbs 22.6. Someone who hasn't read this morning? Jerry, can you read for us? Read for us Proverbs 22 6. Proverbs 22 6. Brenda, could you kindly read for us Proverbs 20 11? Right. Train a child in the way go. And when he is what? Old, he will not turn away from it. Huh? Yes. Yes. Even small children are known by their actions. Isn't it? Those are the wise sayings of David. Now, if a child starts right, of course, what Jerry has read is not always true. Isn't it? That general rule may be broken, but it is the principle that we need to follow. Are we together? The principle behind it is what the Bible wants us to follow. That if a child starts right, there is a fair possibility that the adult of that child, the adult that comes out of that child, will be right as well. A fair possibility. And when that man or woman becomes themselves a parent, then that parent will be right as well. That is why there is that generational aspect that Proverbs 22 6 talks about. Train a child in the way that they should go. 
And when they grow up, they are likely not to depart from what you trained them. If you trained a child to have in their minds the issue of equality and rights as of utmost importance or, or first importance, as they grow up, that is what they keep on thinking about. They keep on thinking about. Some of you, like me, were brought up by parents who did the concept of grace as vividly as we do. They did not know about justification, sanctification, salvation, you know. They did not know those technical terms that they about our redemption through the blood and work, blood of Christ and the work on the cross. They did know it. But with the little they knew, they told you that Christ is good. That God is important. And though we could have strayed along the way, Somehow, by God's grace and love and mercy, he has helped us to remember the little things that our mothers told us. And so that now when salvation was preached to us, it made sense. And we could come to faith. Many a child has benefited from those kind of teachings. From parents who are either illiterate or semi-illiterate, but just pointed their children to God in the best way they knew how. When the children grow up, they get, now when I get saved now, I can tell my children. They can see me living in Christ. And they can say, we know our father, daddy is not perfect. He, he still falls into sin. But this Christ that he has found, daddy, we want to know about it. And so you share with your children about salvation. They too become saved. And generationally, it multiplies. And a generation is given unto God because of a grandmother who taught these commands. To their children. You see how it flows. Train a child in the way that he should go. Children are born with a sinful nature, all of them. And so it seems that some people say that this child is an angel, innocent angel. This one. Why did they do this to an innocent angel? You've seen those pictures on Facebook about women who gave birth and then decided to go and throw their child in the dustbin. The comments, people become holy immediately. And then they say, innocent, what? That's the devil who has been thrown out there. Sinful person. Even that one, if Christ has no mercy on it, goes to hell. What then? If it is not that Christ would have mercy on the one who has been thrown into the dustbin, they will go to hell. There's nothing innocent angel about them. They are not angels. They are human beings born of other human beings who are inherently sinful. You know, this thing is, I want you to understand it this way. It is like when Caro gives birth to CJ. Caro is a black woman. She, she is a black woman. African. Jaluo. Her husband, Jude Ragot, is a black man. When they give birth to CJ, CJ woke as a white woman, wouldn't we be surprised? And say, how come this child is white? The child who comes out should be inherently black. Isn't it? That is, they are born with that nature. It is how we are born with sin. We are conceived blacks and we are born blacks. Are we surprised that we have been born black? Why should we be surprised and yet our parents are black? We shouldn't be surprised. What about white children? When a white man knows his wife who is also white and they bring forth a white child, should they be surprised? That how come this child did not come out black? 
Christian or Chinese. They cannot be because inherently that. And in a similar fashion, even our children are inherently sinful. We cannot expect that when we give back to them, they come out pure and innocent and righteous. And so the word of God says, even children are known by their actions, by their conduct. Their inherently sinful conduct. They are known by it. Those with little ones who have started walking around in the house, you know how they disturb you? They want to break everything. So even when you say daddy, daddy, you know, these days people call their children daddy. They are the dads, but they call their children daddy. When they call their children mommy. To pamper them. But you know, mommy don't do that. Why are you saying don't do that? They are doing something wrong. Who taught them to do something wrong? <laughs> It is inherent. They are just living out their nature. They steal some little sugar and lick it. It is still on their mouth. You ask them, did you steal the sugar? No, I didn't. Who taught them to say that it is wrong to say no? They just learned. It is inherent in them. If we learn to respond to authority in infancy, it is most likely we will follow through in our childhood, teen years, and even in our youth. Yet childhood and youth, young age, pass away so fast. It is a stage of life that is so fleeting, so fast. And the window of opportunity to instill discipline and the right principles into children becomes smaller and smaller with each generation. Like I said, those of us who lived earlier on, we lived with our parents all, almost throughout. These days, children who are in class 4 are taken to boarding school. They don't have time with their, children, with their parents. Class 7, boarding school. People think it is prestigious. Yet, we are looking on training our children. On the opportunities of youth to train our children. And what is it that we are supposed to train our children? What? The commands of God. If you don't come out with anything in this Bible study, come out with this. That parents should teach their children the command. That, that is part of the fifth commandment. If you don't come out with anything, come out with this. That parents, that one of the things in the fifth commandment for honoring your parents is that parents themselves should teach the children the commands of God. Come out with that one. So next week, God willing, when we come back, we will look at what it means to honor your father and your mother. We'll do next week. God willing. Any comments at this stage? Yes, Brother Bonnie. Thank you very much. Thank you. Yes, yes, Roy. Uh, thanks for the introduction. The thing that comes to mind, actually, they've given up this person says for the fact that they, 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 they
thanks for saving me. Um, but what such a thing would be if Christ himself being the Son would have referred to his own will, especially the evil will of the Father's will, especially in the Garden of Gethsemane. Mm. And he takes his heart away from him. It is not the prayer there to be said of his own. Of course, right now you are talking about perfection. You know, perfection. But when we come next week, one of the things we'll be doing is to look at Christ in his human obedience to his own parents. Isn't it? You know, the Bible records something like that. How he himself obeyed his parents. We'll look at that next Sunday. But you are talking obviously is a good thing, only it is loftier. You're talking about perfection. If he's talking about Christ not obeying God in the Garden of Gethsemane, what would have happened to us? Huh? No salvation. Yes, Sister Carol. Welcome. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah. I, it's, I, it, it is what is going on out there, right? And that is why this morning I have gone out of my way and belabored this point that. Did you hear me tell you that teach you anything about teachers should teach our children? Did you hear me saying that? That maybe the schools are not being taught well. I said parents should teach the children what? The commands of God. That, that's what I have really, really tried to do today. The need for us to teach them. Because you know, when we teach them the commands of God, Sister Carol, we sort of focus their minds on what is foundationally right. How does God view you as a girl? How does God view you as a boy? What does God want for you to do as a child, a girl child? What does God want you to do as a boy child? If we find that God is separating those things in the Bible, let us separate them. If we find that he's not separating anything, we don't separate anything. And how will you know how to teach your children those things if you come to the Bible study on time, like you did? Now you will know. He said, those who have not this morning, will they know? They won't know. They will not know. Thank God we came. Because now we know. And children will be encouraged as we continue to do this. Any other comment or question? Yes, Pastor. You moved. <laughs> you are taking care of the young one, yes. 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 Mm. Thank you. Thank you. That's that's a good one, isn't it? So that as you're doing your family devotions, you with the children, you let them also read. What you are saying, they read it themselves, then you explain. So they know it you you just did not come up with it. I think that's very wise, Pastor. Okay, I think there could be no more. Um Comments so that we stop there? Right. Let us pray.
Our Father, as we look at your word and as we learn these things, what comes before our eyes ever so clearly is our own failures as human beings, our own failures as parents, how we have not taught our children the ways of God sufficiently so that they have to, as it were, just grow up in the dark, pick up all sorts of learning everywhere and ideas. The results are clear for all of us to see. Children have become disobedient to authority. There is no respect for old age. There is no respect for adults. There is no respect for schools. On those who lead them, there is no respect in the church, even for those who lead your church. There is no respect for the governing authorities. Nowadays, it is commonplace to hear politicians abusing even the head of state. As if these people who are in authority are nothing before them. Yet somehow we expect that our children will be better than us. How can they be better than us? Oh Lord, come down and help us with wisdom and teach us to know that these simple things that we shout out in podiums are having an effect, a negative effect on our children. Then one day we shall blame them. Yet it is these things that we taught them. Save us from sin. Save us from ourselves. Oh Lord. And for us in GBC Kisumu, as we continue to come Sunday in, Sunday out, to learn the precepts of God, help us that these things, in our own small way, though the world takes its own route, that we will be faithful to your word. And we will teach our children to be different from children out there. That we will tell them that despite what they hear politicians and foolish adults speak out there, we will continue to tell them the commands of God to help them to grow up differently. And that we will make a difference for you, O Christ. For in your name we pray. Amen.